turn off my video so I don't distract myself. So welcome everyone. My name is Diani Faga. I'm the Director of Preservation Services at the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts. We are a nonprofit conservation facility and also preservation education organization. Uh, we're based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but we work all over the country. And um, one of our major funders for this program is the National Endowment for the Humanities. So thank you very much to the NEH for supporting the preservation services we do. Just a few pieces of housekeeping. Um, there are closed captions available, but you may have to enable them within your Zoom settings. I believe, at least on my screen, the option is something along the lines of view full transcript. Um, so if you find, can find that in the, the more option, you will be able to follow along with the closed captions. We will be, I will be taking questions throughout the afternoon, um, afternoon to me anyway. <laughs> um, if you are comfortable with asking questions to the entire group, please feel free to just type them right in the chat. We do also have a Q&A box if you'd rather ask a question directly to me or pose it anonymously for whatever reason, um, you're welcome to do those, to use the Q&A box. I, the presentation is broken up into sections, so I'll be kind of pausing and looking through the chat and Q&A at the end of each session. So you're welcome to ask questions while we're going along, but I might not see it until uh, a few minutes have passed. Before I really jump right in, I do want to give just a bit of a word of warning, kind of a caveat for this program. Um, if anyone has participated in intro preservation education programs before, this is probably not going to be a lot of new information. It may, however, be information in a slightly different order and context than you're used to seeing it. Because my, what I'm here to do today is really encourage you to potentially think differently about the way your organization approaches preservation or collections care. So with that in mind, today we are going to be discussing best practices in preservation but we're not really concerned with following those best practices to a perfect T. What we are interested in is taking the best practice ideas and making them actually usable and practical for smaller organizations or organizations of all sizes. A best practice is fine to have up there in the air as a standard, but is really no good if it's not realistic. And I have worked with, unfortunately, many institutions who have thought, you know, well, if I can't meet this unrealistic level that has been set through this best practice, it's not worth doing at all. And that is not the case. Just because you can't meet the same standards as really large, well-resourced organizations um, does not mean that you are being a bad steward of your collections. In my book, as long as you are on your way and making incremental changes, looking at what is good and what is better, you are being a good steward of your collection and thus, in some respects, doing the best practice that you can do. So what are best practices anyway? What, what are these things that we are going to learn about and potentially disregard? Basically, best practices are a set of standards for the care of collections in the public trust. They aren't rules or laws, but suggestions of care based on the knowledge of what can harm collections. But really, there is a difference between field-wide best practices or what might be considered standards and what are actually practicable best practices for your institution. I want to recognize throughout this entire presentation that finding feasible solutions to preservation problems that fit within your budget, time, and staffing limits 
is an ongoing issue. And unfortunately, I'm not here to offer magical one size fits all solutions. However, what we can do today is talk about how we approach preservation, often with institutions that have limited amount of staff and resources in a more practical way. From our perspective, these best practices can often seem like unachievable goals, a behemoth that keeps organizations from making tiny steps forward just because it seems so impossible. It's the, the cliche of not being able to see the forest for the trees. Rather than present impossible standards, we are instead going to look at preservation as a series of benchmarks. And reaching each benchmark can be broken into smaller tasks. And to do that, while we do need to recognize what the best practice is, we can kind of forget it and establish our own benchmarks to success. So in a way, let's think of everything as uh, liberating you from best practices. I think often people start to think about preservation and get lost in literature and articles, and it can be a lot of concepts or theoretical ideas, but I do want to give you things that you and your staff and volunteers can actually do. And it can be incredibly helpful to break these preservation ideas down into smaller tasks instead of these large concepts and ideas. So reaching each step can be considered a benchmark and a success. And using this model, we can work our way up the staircase or ladder or whatever metaphor you'd like to use. So we will be going through some ideas today and using this model and focus on thinking about preservation incrementally. It's not all or nothing. I work with a lot of different kinds of organizations and I can't tell you how many times I hear as I mentioned earlier, we can't do it the best way, so we keep putting it off. And I want you, if you walk away today learning one thing, I want it to be that it is okay and, in fact, more productive to think incrementally. It doesn't have to be the best in order for you to start taking care of your collections. So I'm splitting everything into three steps. Um, getting started, this is the minimal level of care necessary for responsible stewardship. Really, it's what you need to do to get started on caring for your collections. That said, getting started might be the initial step, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily easy or inexpensive, but it is where you have to start. And really, I also want to encourage everyone, don't feel bad if you are still in or even trying to reach this getting started step. I, I hear you, I see you. That is very, very common with the organizations with whom I work. Good then is a little better than the getting started step, but we still have some room for improvement. And then better is the best we can do right now with our resources and the current research that's available. You'll notice that I didn't include a best category at all. And I think we need to move away from the idea that there even is a best and understand that there will almost always be room for improvement. I've worked at some very large institutions. I've worked at some, with some very small institutions, but I have also worked with some very large ones that have lots of resources in terms of money, staff, materials, and even they definitely had room for improvement. We don't want, let, want to let the good be the enemy of the best um, or vice versa. So I've left it off this list entirely. And this is just um, a little outline for today, what we're going to talk about. Start off by looking at some storage considerations, um, in environmental management, and then these kind of institutional context sections. Uh, that we won't spend a huge amount of time on, but definitely are important to mention as well in terms of policy development and planning and also finances. So starting out, um, and again, I encourage you to ask questions all along. I will 
scroll my, my cursor up to the chat during these slight pauses between sections. But um, jumping right in, the topic of housing and enclosures. So we've all heard this best practice, right? In a perfect world, everything would look like this picture. All materials would be housed in uniform boxes made of quote unquote, archival grade and museum quality materials, terms which we'll get there in a moment, but don't really have any true meaning. Everything would be customized to the materials they're housing. No standard size boxes. All of the boxes are the exact size and shape to fit the collections that they hold, right? But of course, this is not what probably the vast majority of our storage areas look like, and that is okay. It doesn't mean that we're bad stewards of our collections. As long as we're ma making our way up the ladder, we are doing a good job. So let's make our way up that ladder. Getting started. We have things in boxes or some kind of primary enclosure. Anything is better than nothing. Enclosures do all sorts of good things and we'll see their value reiterated throughout this webinar. They offer a buffer layer between your object and environmental factors such as dust, fluctuations in temperature and relative humidity, light exposure and pests. Basically, it, what a buffer layer means is it adds an additional layer before any of those things can start affecting your object. They keep objects uh, relatively supported. They keep things from rolling around or off shelves. They can protect the object from the shelf itself in some situations. And they keep objects from bumping into and damaging each other. If each object is boxed separately or if the box has interior packing. Boxes and enclosures also have the added benefit of being stackable if they're strong enough, which can help with the space planning and organization that we will talk about later. So what, what kinds of boxes are we looking at? What are some options for you know, not necessarily the highest end standardized collections and closures. Cardboard, boxer, cardboard boxes will do in a pinch. Um, my former coworkers, Kat Pearl, is, is modeling the loveliness of sitting inside of a cardboard box on the left hand side of the screen. Um, and as I said, something is better than nothing. So if we're looking at short term solutions, just use any box, just get something in an enclosure. You could also have objects wrapped in bubble wrap or packing blankets for protection. Again, this is not ideal for the long term, but it will do something. It will add an extra layer of protection. Now, there is some concern about the damage that might come from these less than ideal materials, but at least we do have this basic protection from things getting crushed or smashed. Plastic bins are actually a great solution on all of these fronts. Um, you know, sterilite tubs or bins are actually very stable and inert uh, chemically, so they wouldn't probably impact your, your objects detrimentally. And they often can be uh, quite a bit cheaper than the high-end acid-free archival paper boxes. You do want to make sure that you aren't creating a microclimate inside of there, though. So it's important to keep the bins unsealed or at least kind of cracked open to ensure airflow. I do like having lids on boxes, but you could perhaps punch some holes in the lid or in the side of the box. Think about, I, I certainly as a young kid would try and collect lightning bugs in a jar and um, tried to punch holes in the top of the jar to, to get them oxygen. So think of your objects as lightning bugs in a jar. But really what we're doing is we're, we're facilitating airflow so that um, negative things that might be in there, like mold and even dust particles, don't are not able to accumulate. 
And while you're using these less than perfect materials, as I mentioned briefly, and as the, the screen indicates, and it's also important to think about their lifespan. A lot of these materials are more prone to degradation themselves, in addition to potentially transferring some of their bad qualities to the artifacts they're housing. So I put some time ranges to look out for when using them. You don't wanna use these just plain old standard cardboard boxes forever. They will eventually, sooner rather than later in many cases, become very acidic and may cause damage to the object inside. They may break down and collapse, especially if they're stacked on top of one another, which is obviously not ideal. And however, they are great for temporary storage. And while you're getting ready to move on up to your next step or benchmark, because remember we're thinking about this as, as incremental changes and adjustments. So while we are considering primary enclosures and packing, it's good to understand the term archival. Um, now, I'm not saying that in order to be at the good benchmark that you are using all archival materials all the time, but at this, at this stage, at this step on the ladder, you do understand the difference between archival and non-archival, and you're choosing archival when you can. You are being an informed consumer. You can mix and match, as we discussed in the previous example. You can be using a non-archival cardboard box as your primary enclosure, but then potentially keeping it separated from your collection object by using archival tissue paper as additional padding and support. But it's hard to even do this mixing and matching when you don't understand the term. So let's understand some terminology today. Um, there is a resource on CCAHA's website that we can send out when we um, send out a, a link to this recording and a PDF of the presentation. We can also include a link to a guide on our website that really breaks down a lot of this terminology in more depth. Um, but I'll go through many of these terms kind of quickly right now. Um, as I mentioned earlier, unfortunately, when it comes to these materials and supplies, the actual term archival itself is, is nearly meaningless. The term has been overused so much in commercial advertising for preservation and art supplies that it doesn't really mean anything when you see it on a product. So that is why knowing specific manufacturing terms is ultimately much more valuable than referring to and trusting a term like archival. So when you're looking to order and allocate media appropriate for storage, you're better off using very specific requirements like lignin free or acid free with a 3% calcium carbonate reserve, et cetera. So to go quickly through this list and, and give you some definitions. Um, I am not going to go deeply into all of these points, but I do want to just spend a bit of time on a few of them. Um, lignin is very important to many of the other terms. Lignin is a polymer which is found in all vascular plants. It's what makes vegetables firm. It uh, regulates the transport of liquid in a living plant. It allows trees to go taller. In wood, lignin binds cellulose fibers together. Anything made of wood or plants has the potential to become acidic as the lignin breaks down. If something is lignin free, it means that the lignin has been removed either chemically or by using cotton rags rather than um, other, other material rags, which do not contain lignin and will not become acidic over time. So wood pulp paper, paper that was made of trees, ha e either had lignin or has lignin in it. Um, cotton paper, paper made of cotton pulp, uh, does not have lignin in it. The next term is related but different. Um, Acid-free refers to material that was pH neutral at the time of production. 
What this does not mean is that those materials will not become acidic over time uh, because acid free as a term alone does not tell us whether or not the item has lignin. Things can go acidic over time, especially if they do have lignin. So that's why when, when you see kind of the perfect paper, it would be labeled both acid-free and lignin-free. Just acid-free alone isn't necessarily gonna last you forever. Um, so you can use a pH testing pen to determine whether your current housing is or has become acidic. You can use the pen to draw a small line on the housing material you're testing and the color will change depending on the acidity. I'm going to just choose one more of these to go into a little more detail on because we don't have as much time to dwell on all of this. But um, the next one I want to discuss is the PAT, the Photographic Activity Test. For housing photographs, you will wanna make sure that projects have passed this PAT. This is um, something that was developed by the Image Permanence Institute. The test explores interactions between photographic images and the enclosures in which they're stored. So the PAT is used routinely to test papers, adhesives, inks, glass, framing components, sleeving materials, scrapbooking supplies, as well as basically anything that could conceivably come in contact with photographs should have been subjected to this photographic activity test. Products which have passed the PAT will generally have this labeled in the material specifications. So it's really ideal that materials used to house or store photographic materials has this designation. And for the rest of these terms, as I mentioned, there is a resource on our website with more information on that. And I will point that to you, point you to that following this presentation. At this better step, you're actually ordering and obtaining housing supplies systematically for the purpose of rehousing objects. And you should also have a reserve of supplies for those last minute things that come up. My kind of sneak around um, non-traditional preservation lecture tip for this slide is that I'm, I'm here to empower you. You don't have to order from the vendors that are specifically designated as you know, archival product vendors if you know what you're looking for. So if you go through and learn the terms um, that were on the previous slide and, and more terms that are in various resources, you can check product descriptions, call manufacturers, um, and, and know what you're looking for. Really, you should be doing this even for products that come from the, the top of the line uh, supply vendors. Just because it's in one of those catalogs does not mean that it's actually meeting all of the specifications that you're looking for. Um, so I just have a, a list, you know, slightly outside the box list of um, retail spaces on the slide here that that may likely sell some of the stuff that you're looking for if if you know what you're what you're looking for. Another thing to um, be smart about is if you can buddy up with another organization and place orders for supplies together. Price points often drop as the number of materials ordered increases. If other local sites are in need of the same products, order together. We encourage this all the time in emergency preparedness, the field of emergency preparedness that, that nearby sites team up and offer to serve as each other's response teams or share supplies after 
a disaster, why not do this kind of preemptively as well and order supplies together? You may be able to get bulk discounts. And then finally, in this category, I'm the, the best, I'm the, excuse me, not the best, I'm going to slap myself on the wrist there. The, the better category is having housing that is specifically customized for your particular object needs. We discussed briefly the, the idea that, so, okay, having something in a box is great. Having something supported and protected in a box so it's not kind of rattling around in there is even better. You may take that interior packing step up another level by not just using scraps, but using intentionally purchased supplies to create really customized housing solutions. You can either retrofit the interiors of pre-made boxes to really snugly hold and support your artifacts, or even make your own boxes to fit in your exact storage areas and exactly fit your specific artifact. And I'm not just talking about, you know, so-called museum objects, three-dimensional objects, but um, definitely for, for those of you from library and archival institutions, um, this goes for books and other bound volumes as well, particularly older, fragile bound volumes can do really well with being supported in a box. Finally, my final point in this section is I want to draw your attention to the resource up on the screen, which we'll talk about a little bit later as well, but Stash C, which stands for Storage Techniques for Art, Science, and History Collections. For more ideas about customized storage and for more tips and tricks about lower cost but still appropriate archival materials, check out that website. I definitely recommend um, checking that out, particularly for these kind of somewhat storage solutions that might be considered somewhat outside of the realm of standard. If it's weird, they've figured out a way to house it. So I am coming to the end of a section now. I see. Um, had a question come through. Is it true that most laser printing or copy paper is actually buffered? Um, I don't actually know. Ex the, I, I'll, I would have to get back to you on that, Tim. Thank you for that question. I know, so just to, to unpack this a little bit more for the rest of the audience, because this is one that I did kind of skip over, um, buffered materials. So we talked about acid-free materials. Buffered materials actually have an, an alkaline reserve added during manufacture. So this is a, the buffer, which gives the housing material actually not just in a, a neutral pH, but an alkaline pH and helps protect paper objects from acid migration or acidic pollutants in the environment. This also can work to counteract that lignin breakdown. Um, and I, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know the actual answer to that question when thinking about you know just the, the most kind of uh, off the shelf laser printing copy paper. Um, I, I will have to get back to you on that, Tim. Sorry about my lack of immediate response. Um, questions for now? All right, I'm going to put my way back in my notes and move on. Okay, so storage space. Now that we have everything, or at least we know what we're looking for when it comes to housing and enclosures, what do you do with them? How do you make space for them? Because getting things in a box, getting things somehow protected is, is a pretty different game from actually dealing with the space consideration. 
Um, as I've said a few times, I work with many different organizations all over the place. And I can tell you, I don't think I've ever worked with someone who said they have too much space. So if you are struggling with this issue, you are definitely not alone. So some of the best practices that we are here to acknowledge and uh, deal with to whatever extent we can are making sure that materials are housed. It, this, this says six inches. I would, I would moderate that a bit to say four to six inches off the floor for um, largely for flood protection, but for other housekeeping considerations as well. Um, this is the one that's really kind of laughable for probably nine and a half out of 10 organizations. Um, so you're not alone that storage spaces can accommodate 10 years worth of growth. And all storage furniture is made of very particular types of materials, uh, metal, specifically designed for that space. So this one, this getting started point is a good example of what I said in the beginning of the first step is not always easy, but I don't want to us to get too overwhelmed by this. I want us to still think about how we can break things down into those smaller tasks so that this is actually achievable. It is very difficult to do any sort of space planning, definitely not informed, effective space planning without knowing what you have. When you're getting started on this, you wanna have a very good handle on the specific needs of the collections and what is available to you in terms of both furniture and space. Pulling this information together though can be difficult. And although, you know, in terms of resources, it would only cost time, which I know is a very valuable resource. Um, and especially as, you know, now when I'm aware that some organizations still don't even have collection staff on site full time. Um, I myself am, I actually, as of this week, I'm still permanently remote. In a couple of weeks, I'll be flexing my way back into the office. But, you know, these projects where you really do have to be in the space to take inventories and do measurements and everything, they can be challenging when we're not in the space all of the time. For the collections though, um, having something like a collections development policy in place is definitely very helpful in determining if there are many materials outside the collecting scope of your institution and therefore target for potential deaccessioning. Of course, deaccessioning is not at all an end all be all solution, but it's certainly something that might ensure that you're using your limited resources like space more wisely. It's also important to consider some of the other factors I've listed as they may affect how and where collections should be stored. Um, there is always an element of prioritization in space planning. So we want to make sure that our most sensitive, vulnerable, significant collections, however we define those, those terms, um, are stored in the space that has the best environment, the best furniture, the best security, et cetera. There might not be a whole lot you can do right away to tackle the overall space crunch issue, but you can reach the getting started benchmark by knowing your collections and what else is available to you. So having a relatively updated inventory, having kind of a, a, a log of what storage furniture you have in which spaces. In some smaller institutions, this is going to be a lot more, I, I certainly can't say easy, but a lot more straightforward if you just have one or two storage spaces in larger collections or in spaces where um, the collection might not be large in terms of volume, but it is spread out all over the place. I, I acknowledge this, this is not an easy task, but it is an important getting started point.
How many of you have a storage space that looks something like the image on the left? Almost every organization that I've worked with um, to, to some extent. And at this point, I do wanna give a shout out to the Wharton Eschrick Museum. A, a previous iteration of this presentation was um, developed in collaboration with staff at the Wharton Eschrick Museum. Um, so want to thank them for allowing us to use some of their kind of <laughs> skeletons in the closet, but you know, it's, it's for a good cause. Um, another way to tackle getting started is to approach space planning, space reorganization on one room at a time or closets as the case may be. Uh, this, these photos are before and after reorganization and a space saving project at the Wharton Eschrick Museum in Malvern, Pennsylvania. They too were highly overwhelmed with the thought of comprehensive space planning. So instead took it back to just moving in small steps, starting with a, a, a targeted storage space, this closet. They looked at all of the collections in this closet and determined which pieces fit into the collecting scope. They determined that they had a lot of duplicates and also non collections materials in this area, so they were able to discard a, a significant amount. Then they made sure that everything was housed reasonably well it, it looks quite beautiful to me in the image. Um, following many of the steps we saw in the last segment and then they were able to use this this same space more appropriately. It's not a perfect space, and there are definitely still some issues, boxes still sitting on the floor, for example, but I think we can all agree, even just by seeing these quick snapshot photos, this is a def big improvement. Of course, this wasn't easy, but in terms of cost, it wasn't actually an expensive project either. Um, they used discarded boxes from a neighboring institution they had help from interns and volunteers from a local museum studies program, and they, they got through it. It wasn't all of their storage. It didn't address their entire problems, enti entire space crunch problems. But think of what a weight off one's shoulders it would be to have just one accomplishment like this. So start small. Give yourself a project that can be a positive achievement, even if it's not one room. What if it's one shelf? There's one kind of horror shelf of unknown materials. Set aside a day or two and just go through the horror shelf. And um, you know, even if you don't get to the point of rehousing, just get a sense, get an accurate sense of what's there. And you might feel more encouraged and empowered to continue moving forward. So you can tackle reorganization room by room, but I wanted to point out another resource that is incredibly helpful and free at guiding you through the collections storage organization process. The process is called Reorg, and you can sign up for a free account at the website on the screen. Um, it's, it's a Canadian, initiative, which is why they, they have to <laughs> stipulate that you're looking for the English version of the website. Um, but the online portal will help you do a self evaluation of your storage spaces, and then will assist you in coming up with a logical approach to reorganization. If you're worried about space, if you're really struggling with space planning, and how to even approach organization, I definitely recommend checking out this website as one of your steps. Now, when we move up the ladder or the staircase into the good benchmark, one thing that we might get to uh, is adapting storage furniture that we already have to meet our needs. So in that best practices, we learned that um, Ideally, the best practice is we have storage furniture that is very targeted, dedicated specifically to our collection needs. That is not the case for most of us, especially if we're not moving into purpose-built facilities, storage spaces. 
Um, but here in the getting started step, we evaluated what we have and figured out what might work, what some of our options are. Now we can actually start modifying things to fit into the nooks and crannies that we might have. But we need to make sure we're doing this in a way that is still good for clients. Here on the left-hand side of this screen, we see a, a I, I give them an A for effort because they, they used a storage locker um, for storing materials, um, but does not end up being such, a, such an ideal adaptation of available storage furniture. I do think there would be an appropriate way of using this space, per, perhaps stacking boxes on top of one another inside of it. Um, but actually piling up books from what appears to be from, you know, the bottom to what appears to be perhaps four feet up, um, not, not the most accessible or safe storage solution. Over on the right hand side of the screen, however, we see a much better adaptation. So just to explain what we're actually looking at, this institution took some old um, standard size library bookshelves and place them back to back with each other and then use them to stack oversized portfolios. Um, so what so called standard library shelves are often way too shall shallow for anything even approaching oversized if they're just built to fit, you know, mass market paperbacks or, or whatnot, but placing them back to back, if there's a relatively um, seamless gap between, hey, you have a shelf that's double double wide. So this organization used that definitely to their advantage. If you are in a historic house museum or, um, you know, any type of historic facility where you have furniture as kind of part of your display, part even of your storage spaces. You can potentially even adapt historic furniture. Um, and this is, these are more examples from the Wharton Ashrick Museum. Ashrick was a woodworker and has all kinds of really unique storage items around his house, which is now the museum. Since space is so limited, the curator and program director decided that it would be really a shame to leave those available storage spaces empty. So what they did is they placed a buffer or barrier layer between the collections they're storing in the cabinets. Um, having a layer between the object itself and the potentially harmful outside world, as we discussed previously, is really helpful. And when dealing with wood in, in these wooden furniture pieces, which remember we learned has that lignin in it, it's really important to keep the acid away from the artifacts. So this can either be simply putting an object in an enclosure and putting it in a wooden cabinet or on wooden shelves in a small closet or in a drawer in a dresser. Um, or by lining the wooden cabinet with a layer of another material that can absorb the acid before it makes its way to the artifact. So again, just making the best use of the space we have available, often using creative, potentially not quickly thought of solutions like these. And then even better, of course, than adapting what you already have would be creating or purchasing what you need. And when I say that, again, I don't even mean that you need to be buying the fanciest compact shelving units that are, are purpose designed for uh, archival collections or anything like that. Again, you can definitely look at hardware stores to see what might be less expensive and still of good quality for storage, as long as you are an informed consumer. You can also purchase raw materials and make things for yourself, yourself if you're handy or have someone around on staff or on a team that um, is interested in, in doing so. There are also uh, shelving guidelines sheets available that I can link you to after this 
program that give you a little more information on what types of products to look for when considering creating or purchasing shelving materials. This is also a good resource to have handy when you're considering the storage furniture you already have and what might be of appropriate quality. And you can also find all kinds of ideas about how to make shelving units on the two websites that I mentioned previously, both Reorg and Stash C have some really interesting ideas. This tip works beyond shelving as well. I've included a picture, the image all the way on the right here is a cart that the Athenaeum in Philadelphia created to help safely navigate their very narrow storage aisles with the large architectural blueprints they have. So you can see the cart, there are two levels on the cart. And rather than have these, these large blueprints um, overhanging the edges or having to have some sort of stiff surface atop the cart, um, because they had narrow aisles, they built this, this lovely curved cart top to um, safely transport the, the blueprints. That wouldn't be a long-term storage solution because you want to store those materials flat, but definitely fantastic for transporting. All right, I am moving on. Let me check my chats and Q&A. And again, just to, to remind everyone, you're welcome to pop questions in the chat or in the Q&A box at any time. Oh, okay. Well, thank you for looking into that. Reorg is now offline, um, but a participant found the, the reorg.info site is offline, but a very, thank, thank you so much, Michelle. That's my lesson learned for not checking all of my links right before I did a presentation, but um, looks like hopefully that it's still kind of the extent of the resources available. Um, I do know that it's at least last time I talked to anyone from there, which admittedly has been um, a, a few years at this point. Um, I know it was an ongoing initiative and it looks like now, um, <laughs> now ICROM is uh, hosting at least some element of it. So fantastic. Thank you very much for updating that resource. And so, yeah, if, if anyone, I, I can't guarantee it'll be exactly the same as it was um, when last I played with it, but definitely worth checking out. So thank you very much. All right, so I'm gonna move on. This is obviously a really big topic for the next session, one what section and one that we could definitely spend an entire day discussing. So we are really just going to graze the surface on this as we begin to break things down into our benchmarks. And there are many resources out there, including recorded webinars on our YouTube channel that go into a lot more detail than I'm going to just now. But just wanna, since it's so critically important, just want to talk about um, environmental management in terms of these benchmarks as well. So similarly, similarly to how we got started in our last section on space planning, it's really important to know what you're dealing with before getting into a situation. So again, this first benchmark can simply be that. Know your environmental management situation. For temperature and RH, this can include purchasing and installing data loggers. Um, this is another area, perhaps the most common, where I often work with institutions who are not monitoring at all because they, they, they perceive there is nothing they can do to change the situation. That is not true <laughs> um, for many different reasons. For many grant applications, having the information about your environment can help support your request, um, even if it 
proves to be a very poor environment, you know, that makes it a more compelling project to fund for, for some funders. Being armed with these numbers can help you to better advocate for something like upgrades to an HVAC system to your board or upper administration. And you might also be surprised to find that some areas of your building may just really be better off environmentally than others and therefore better places to store more sensitive, vulnerable collections. I also often see um, people taking hand reading recordings off of thermostats, um, which is certainly a, a stopgap measure and will give you a moment in time uh, measurement of what's in your space, but doesn't really give you enough in, informed information to make decisions such as determine where it might be a good natural storage areas as a data logger is a, a monitor that actually records temperature and relative humidity over time. Data laggers can be surprisingly inexpensive and can give you much more comprehensive information. Uh, CCAHA put together a quick comparison chart of various types of relatively inexpensive data loggers on our website, which is listed here and also will be included with the resources. Light monitoring is a bit trickier, but at least you can see it. Uh, you may just know where light hits and when in your buildings but of course, recording that info will be more beneficial to help you make decisions. You can get textile fade cards like those you see on the screen and leave them out in a space to see how the light might be affecting your artifacts. Um, and that's what's up on the left here. But honestly, to a certain extent, construction paper works for the same effect. Um, construction paper, as probably many of us have experienced, tends to fade very quickly when exposed to a lot of light. So you can cut little pieces out and place them all around your storage area, keeping one, one piece in darkness. So say we're, we're chopping up this green sheet here, we would take one corner of it and keep that in a drawer where it's not getting exposed to any light at all. So the other pieces we can bring back and compare the extent of fading to that protected green piece in the drawer. And you can get you know, the, the range of different levels of light exposure. Don't forget to label which one is where, of course. <laughs> um, and then you can take them all out and compare. And you might just see that some areas naturally stay a bit dimmer than others, even if you, you didn't necessarily notice it by walking in a room. Same thing goes with pests. You have to know which insects and other pests are a problem for you before you can actually do anything about it. Um, you know, many organizations contract this work out, um, and that's great. I'll be noting it in the in the better step later. In fact, but unfortunately, many times I've I've witnessed when pests. And any type of pest management is contracted out. Um, there isn't always a really strong line of communication between collection staff and the contractors about their findings. So collection staff might not really know if there is an issue or not. And oftentimes these contractors might not even know about our specific needs in terms of pest control. So the relationship doesn't end up quite amounting to the, the fruition that it really should. Pest monitoring for yourself, on the other hand, is not hard or expensive, and it's probably a better first step to getting a handle on what your situation is before you start contracting things out. You can get this whole kit pictured here on the right for just over $100, and it would have you set for quite some time. Um, or you can do it on a much more piecemeal basis using like sticky traps that are available for just a few dollars for a pack. Once you know what kind of pests you have and where they might be getting in, then you can start taking action, including talking to vendors for a service contract. 
And another getting started step in each of these areas, temperature, relative humidity, light, and pests is again, putting things in boxes. Boxes protect against fluctuations in temperature and RH and make it so even if your environment is not well controlled, your artifacts will still have a little bit more protection. Boxes, of course, block light, so you don't have to worry as much about exposure. And lastly, boxes will give pests one more layer of stuff to eat through before getting to your artifacts. So by boxing stuff, you're also getting this first step of preservation crossed off on a lot of multiple lists. So we know our situation, that's our getting started. And moving on up into our good is regulating. For temperature and relative humidity, it's important to be able to block severe fluctuations from happening when you can. Keeping things stable is often a lot more important than staying within a really tightly well-defined range, which might be somewhat counter to what we see in the best practices literature. But some of the worst damage from temperature and RH comes from when they're wildly changing back and forth. So instead of really knocking ourselves out trying to be in this very tight, perfect range, we're better off on spending our efforts to keep things as stable as possible and avoiding really extreme ends of the spectrum. You might be surprised what is possible with just a fan to circulate air. Using your data loggers, you can see what might be the best times of day to turn on and off fans that keep things stable. Standalone dehumidifiers and hu humidifiers are also quite helpful. But again, it must be accompanied by good monitoring and making sure that dehumidifiers are emptied or, or automatically drain. A low tech way to bring up the RH in a very dry room without a humidifier or humidification system is to simply put bowls of water on top of or in front of floor or baseboard vents to allow moisture to evaporate and raise the RH. I know that might sound reckless. Why would we want a bowl of water in our storage area? But in, in, in winter months, um, having particularly in winter months in some areas of the country all of the year, having really, really dry conditions, that's not good for our collections. So the risk of someone, you know, maybe kicking over a small bowl of water, <laughs> that that might be worth it if we can raise the humidity in a space a little. For light exposure, really we, we wanna block light however we can. This can be as simple as adding curtains to windows as you see here, but if it's just in storage, you don't even need anything this nice, a cardboard board, a cardboard board or some other cover over a window will do. UV filtering on windows and bulbs is actually not that expensive. It is, however, a pain to change out and it does break down over time. So really blocking all light is, is probably the most straightforward, cost-effective, safest option. If that is not an option, you can cover artifacts, hopefully in a box, but if they're too big or maybe on exhibit, um, you can cover things with a sheet when the institution is closed to reduce light exposure. Block what you can is also a good approach to take for pests. Sealing doors and windows will not only help you keep out pests, but will also help with temperature and relative humidity regulation. So hitting two birds with one stone. Also, once you know what you have, you can specifically know how to block out that particular pest. Um, so certain techniques work will work for, for one sort of pest that will not work for another. Um, so part of, again, part of the reason it's so important to understand our situation. And then in the better, no real cheap solutions here, unfortunately. Nothing can really replace having a good HVAC system for getting toward that 
top of the line conditions. I often advise institutions that that don't have a really robust HVAC system or need really extensive upgrades or, or for whatever whatever considerations this seems out of reach. One one consideration, if at all possible, is to create a sinking fund or savings account where you can put a little money in each month to to develop a reserve. This can be used for other maintenance projects, replacements, or even an emergency as well. Once you do have a new system, or if you have an HVAC system in place that just might be a little clunky, uh, doing upkeep is really critically important. Changing filters regularly, ideally quarterly, and making sure it's serviced at least once a year. Get a service contract contract in place so that you don't have to keep track of everything on your own, but also create a policy and procedure like a cyclical maintenance policy that will help to support this and record what you're doing. Once you're able to get a new system installed, if, if you are, uh, keep track of your warranty information. Sometimes there are services that are covered for a certain period of time in your warranty and, and take advantage of that. When you're on a shoestring budget, every bit of that counts. For light, um, the, the better category is a bit more achievable. Um, switching to LEDs. And LEDs are often a... Um, relatively expensive initial investment that tends to pay off over time. LED lights emit less UV light and are more energy efficient. So you can usually make a good sale for this to the board or upper management, the, the paying off over time element. The <clears throat> initial investment might be a bit, but it will pay off in the long run. Also depending in some states, you can actually get some breaks for make, making the switch. I know at some point in Pennsylvania, you could get a free assessment and some assistance in making the switch from the local energy company. So definitely look into that if that might be the case in your region. And then to take this section full circle, as I mentioned before, having a contract in place with a pest management company is a great thing to do, especially if you know what you're dealing with. Um, it has to be done correctly. In this better step, you would have a contract with a pest company that is familiar with cultural organizations and where you are communicating regularly about not only the findings of their monitoring, but also things like what types of chemicals and treatments they're using, assuring that they will not harm collections. Pest infestations are expensive, so it's best not to have them. Um, and these service providers can set up systems for inspections, including outside spraying, bait or traps that won't use harmful chemicals, et cetera. Um, but the, that communication piece is really key to having that be an effective relationship. Um, I'm looking back at the chat and I'm glad that the construction, the construction paper idea resonated. I cannot take credit for that, but it really does seem kind of brilliant. Um, I will, Grace, I will have to get back to you on what exactly um, the image in that past box is from. I am, I'm assuming that this is something that came from like uh, Gaylord or Hollinger Metal Edge or, or one of the vendors, but what exactly it's called, I am not 100% sure. So what I will do is I'll figure that out. I'm making a note to myself um, and include that in the email as well, if, if possible. And Oh, Tim, great question. Do you have advice for when exterminators and or chemicals are necessary? Yes, I sort of. Um, basically, when a, a pest problem is, is so out of hand or 
the types of insects we're dealing with are not susceptible to non-chemical responses, um, definitely there's, there's a give and take there. So it's not like we would say that we always absolutely have to avoid um, <laughs> all chemical treatments just because some might have unknown effect on the collections. If we're dealing with a massive pest infestation, um, the, um, sorry, I distracted myself. I have to close this for a second while I'm <laughs> thinking, I, and then I'll get back to the rest of the questions. Um, when, when you're making that type of, of balance, give or take decision, it's really, what is the higher risk? Is the risk of the potential chemical impact does that outweigh the risk that the pests are causing to your collections, your space, your building, et cetera, or, or vice versa? Um, there are certain chemicals that have been for like really intensive, um, in, invasive extermination treatments that have been studied uh, in their impacts on collections. Um, I know at some point the, the Smithsonian was doing studies on exact chemical responses and, and their potential impacts on collections. And there were some that seemed like really, really nasty chemicals that basically the conservation scientists ultimately were like, well, they're, they're okay for the collections. So as long as we keep people out of this space for a while. Um, so that might sometimes, it might sometimes come to that. There are, though, a lot of measures that don't require those extensive chemical treatments. Freezing can go a long way. Now, again, in a massive infestation where you're dealing with boxes and boxes and boxes or, you know, pests inside storage furniture and carpeting and, and room fixtures, that might be a different story. But when it's if it's just the collections, um, getting working with um, a facility that would would help you freeze materials can be really beneficial as well. Um, any advice about the color spectrum of LED lights? I, I don't want to get into a big discussion on this now, number one, because it's not, again, it's not my total area of expertise, but number two, because I have a really good resource <laughs> that goes into exactly that. So I will also include a resource on the color discussion of LED lights. Um, I saw a, a pretty good, good interesting presentation um, a, a few years ago from a, a gentleman who does all of his research on light exposure to collections. And that was specifically what he covered. So I will follow up with that as well. And then um, thank you for including the, uh, the link to that, the infographic on why archival. Um, so yeah, that gets a little more into some of the details on those terms. And, um, all right, I am gonna move on. So there are there are two more sections, but rest easy. These are both much quicker sections. So we'll be we'll be wrapping up with time for questions shortly enough. So moving on to um, the, the things that I've lumped into institutional management are um, policies and preservation relating related planning. So best practice is that we would be routinely conducting these assessments of collections care issues and we would have all collections related policies formally recorded in writing with official formal adoption by the the highest governing body of the institution. What else can we do if we're not quite there? Getting started. So having, having assessments done is, is actually a getting started measure. 
um, because that is going to help you know where to start. Some of these are free or have low costs associated. You can get a lot of grant funding for um, preservation needs or risk assessments, and we'll talk more about grants in a moment. Some have outsiders involved, some are self-guided, but here is just a list of places to start. So starting with the Preservation Self-Assessment Program, this is a free online tool that helps uh, collection staff prioritize efforts to improve conditions of collections. Um, it is all, it's all kind of self-guided. So it does take time to um, put in information on your materials, your storage and exhibit environments, your institutional policies, et cetera. Um, but the, the tool then will kind of spit out reports on the factors that impact the health of your particular materials and define the points from which to begin care. Um, the next three on the list are types of assessments that would have an external assessor uh, come help you, come, come to your site or meet with you virtually as the case may be. Uh, CAP assessments, those are um, it's the Collections Assessment Program through FAIC, the Foundation for the American Institute of Conservation. Um, so those are assessments that are specifically aimed at small to mid-sized institutions in a historic structure. So what these assessments are, are it's, it's a, a collections assessor and a building assessor. So the collections assessor will give you tips and recommendations on how to care for your collections. The building assessors will give you information on historic preservation uh, and, and building related information. So those are really fantastic if you're in a historic site. A map assessment, that stands for museum assessment program, that's through the American Alliance of Museums. That's not as much collections focused as it is kind of museum policy focused. Um, so it's around, you know, things like audience engagement and your, your interpretation, pro, interpretive programs, etc. Um, the Conservation Center, we, we provide assessment programs. Um, we actually just a couple weeks ago uh, finished accepting applications for our current round of assessments. Um, but we will work with organizations at, at any time to work on grant funded programs or um, you know, with, if, if you are applying for a grant or if you need a preservation needs assessment conducted, that's something that we can help you, we can discuss potential sources of grant funding, et cetera. Um, and also in next spring, uh, we'll be launching another application round for our extremely subsidized or free, depending on the circumstances, um, assessment programs. And then the AIC risk assessment and planning tool, that's another self-guided one, and it's specifically around risk assessment. So with specifically with kind of emergency preparedness in mind. Thinking along the lines of um, starting, starting small with policy development, you're probably already doing some things. You might be doing housekeeping on a regular basis, but you just don't have a policy in place. Policies are really important for consistency. Just write down what you are already doing, even if it's not kind of formally approved and adopted in, in a formal mechanism. Just having some record of the way that you do things will help help for continuity, consistency, training, et cetera, et cetera. There are tools online that help with this as well. Um, there are a, a good handful for emergency planning, like this, the Council of State Archivists developed this uh, pocket response plan. CCAHA is actually currently developing an online collections management policy toolkit to be launched uh, hopefully later this year. So definitely stay on the lookout for that if you're in the position of 
needing a fully new or, or substantial updates to a collections management policy. And um, would definitely also encourage institutions to work together on policy development as well. It helps to have friends and colleagues in the same boat. And you don't have to recreate the wheel, rip off and duplicate as much as you can. And then um, better is striving to have these documents. So um, these, these are not all of the AAM core documents, but if you must pick only five, if, if we're, you know, having to prioritize starting essentially from scratch, these are the documents that I would recommend for cultural collecting institutions to have on hand. This is actually um, the end of this section. So I'm gonna pause here and read the, the chat. Um, so AIC Connecting to Collections just had a discussion about why unbleached muslin should not be purchased from a fabric store for reasons of sizing, home washing machines, dryers, and scented products, and that only muslin purchased from a preservation supply vendor is the way to go. Would fabric store fabric be considered a good level practice for smaller institutions that don't have a big budget? I would say so. I would say yes in that realm of thinking that something is better than nothing. So fa fabric from a fabric store, that's a layer that no fabric over collections in storage is not. Um, you might think of that, like, like when we were talking about the cardboard boxes, um, think of it possibly as a temporary solution, as a solution before you can raise the, the funds and allocate the resources to purchase unbleached muslin from a preservation supply vendor, right? So, um, I, I think as seeing it as an incremental step is, I, I, I would give you permission to <laughs> see it that way. And also I think, you know, even by, by recognizing that and pointing out the, the question, um, that indicates that you're an informed consumer and you like knowing what you're looking for in some respects is the most important part of, of being a responsible steward when it comes to materials and supplies. Um, so yes, I, I would see that as a, a good level practice for smaller institutions that, that do not have the prioritization in the budget um, for purchasing the potentially higher quality material. Um, another question is unbleached muslin preferable to acid free lignin paper wrapping or does that depend on what you're wrapping. Um, that's a very great question so the unbleached muslin that's mostly for larger items, so if you're wrapping sculptures or furniture or if you're laying fabric over a, a case to protect it from dust or over some i've even seen some storage spaces where organizations will lay fabric over an entire shelving unit to protect from dust and light. Um, so for smaller things, paper is gonna be preferable. Um, but when you get to like kind of unusual shaped material um, that, you know, paper might be weirdly crumply when you try to fold it around um, or, or much larger material that paper just wouldn't be realistic, um, that's when, when fabric is warranted. Excellent question. All right, I'm going to move on then and just kind of quickly give a couple tips for incremental improvements in managing finances. Best practice here is that your organization or department has a specific dedicated line item for preservation, for supplies, for preservation training, um, for conservation treatment. And you are also regularly applying for grant funding to support collections care initiatives. 
Getting started, however, manage the budget you have. Having a line item for preservation is fantastic, but it's not always, you can't always make the case for that. And, and it's not always a feasible recommendation. It is looked well upon by funders. It does increase the value of preservation institution-wide. So I would definitely advocate for having a dedicated fund for preservation, whether it's a line item in the budget, whether it's a dedicated fund or, or a count or, you know, however your organization does budgeting, having that specifically allocated can go a long way. Um, but I also know that it's, it's not always going to be feasible. So um, I would also advocate at the getting started step is always be ready. Have a list of what you need for your collection and prioritize that list. So if money ever lands in your lap, you're prepare, prepared and you could avoid a use it or lose it type situation. Sometimes we have no idea when donors might be kind of lingering in the woodwork or when a, a board member will decide they're, going, decide they're going to step down from the board and make a significant donation on their departure. Things like that, you, it, it, it may well not come or it may, it may be a long time till this, this sort of windfall comes, but um, it's always really helpful to have kind of a wish list going uh, because it'll help you prioritize if and when you do find the, the resources. And the same goes for grant funding. You know, sometimes grants will pop up that have a really short, relatively short turnaround time between application, between announcement and application and award. Um, so it's really helpful to be prepared with kind of a list of what you need for in case that pops up. This is mostly referring to, to grant funding, but might apply to, you know, donor development as well. Um, but I would definitely recommend looking locally to local foundations. Um, foundations often prefer supporting organizations within a particular region, um, local chambers of commerce or historic preservation committees might have funding available. Um, this is the, the images are from, as it indicates on the screen, um, porch repair at historic Sugar, Sugartown Incorporated, um, also in Malvern, Pennsylvania, using a PHMC grant, so the Pennsylvania Historic Museums Commission. Um, CC, for, for those of you who are uh, local to the Philadelphia office of CCAHA, um, we sometimes offer programs for regional institutions in the Philadelphia area that are funded through the William Penn Foundation, a funder that also really likes to work locally or at least regionally. So these local programs in, in looking at grant funding, these might be less competitive than the big guys, the, the national programs um, so you might, if you have not ever applied for a grant before, you might consider starting out on that local level. But don't be afraid to go for the big grants. Even if you are coming from a much smaller organization, they want to help you. And there are certain grant categories just for small to mid-sized organizations, particularly the NEH Preservation Assistance Grants and the IMLS Inspire Grants. Um, we are, are running short on time here, so I want to just, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I will say a few more words about kind of my favorite of these, which I already touched on. Um, and we at CCAHA have worked on many preservation assistance grants through NEH over the years. So these are grants that are available. They're, they're aimed to small to mid-sized organizations. Um, they are, the applications are typically due in January um, and they fund up to $10,000 programs with no match required. So it's, it's fantastic, you know, you, you just get the money and you must execute the project, but you don't have to 
put up any of your own budget or funding to to match that. So it's a really fantastic opportunity. Like I said, it is specifically aimed to smaller organizations. So don't be intimidated by a large national agency. Um, and they also, they support like the, the getting started projects. So we have worked on probably the most common thing that we have worked with organizations on through these preservation assistance grants is um, preservation needs assessments, which is essentially the, the first step in getting a understanding and control of your preservation needs and collections. So that is, my presentation. Um, I'm going to move to the next slide just so you have my information. I am going to, if I can figure out how, I'm going to, okay, there it is. I'm going to turn my video back on. Um, we have about only about three more minutes uh, for questions, but I'm glad we had the opportunity to answer some questions as we went along. So if anyone else has questions, in these last couple minutes, I'm definitely happy to, to stick around and field them. If not, um, I wanna say thank you so much to everyone this afternoon. I'm always reachable via email. Phone is a little spotty. Like I said, I'm still working remotely. Um, so I, uh, it email, email is faster. I will get your call eventually if you call me, but it might have to, make its way through a weird voicemail tunnel first. Um, but thank you all so much. I, I Part of my job, part of my mission is taking preservation questions and trying to direct folks to resources. Um, that's why I don't feel so bad about not having immediate answers to all the questions here, because what I, what I know I can do is provide links and resources, and we will be sending out um, information afterwards. Uh, about all of the things that I mentioned, including two questions that I wrote down during the presentation. So thank you. It is a beautiful day in Philadelphia. And I'm sad to say that I have not even 